Well, welcome to this afternoon session. So uh, uh, we uh, uh, hope all of you had a good lunch and are ready to dive back into this, uh, you know, the, the next uh, learning session uh, here. Um, this particular session, um, yeah. so uh, this session uh, is titled The Digital Foundation for Delivering Energy as a Service with Microgrids. So we are actually connecting two themes here, microgrids and uh, energy as a service and the role that they actually play, you know, either complementary or competing or what have you. Our panelists will actually lead us through that uh, today and uh, uh, give, us, uh, give us some insights into that. Uh, as we get started, um, I have a question that we're going to throw up on uh, Slido. Some of you may have used this in the past. Uh, you know, if you have the app, you can, uh, uh, you can um, uh, answer it, and then we'll see how the answer shows up uh, later on. Um, uh, there, are, there are a few. Okay, okay. Well, the first question right there is, uh, do you think energy as a service needs microgrids? So please, you know, dive in with your answers, and we'll see what the answers look like uh, in a minute. Okay. So as we get going, um, I'm Sunil Charan. I'm the founder and CEO of Spire. Uh, we have been developing uh, microgrid-related control software and platform technologies for, uh, you know, uh, m many years now, coming up on 20 years. So uh, we have seen uh, sort of the ups and downs in this space for uh, quite a while. So today I'm actually delighted to introduce this panel, uh, this um, you know, very distinguished panel here to, uh, to dive into some of the details of this particular topic that, uh, that we are interested in. So um, uh, starting at the far end, uh, we have uh, um, Mike, um, you know, uh, who's going to, he, he's from Intel, and uh, he'll be telling us a little bit about the, the digital infrastructure that uh, almost all industries have, and uh, energy industry, I think, in particular needs a lot of. Uh, uh, next, uh, uh, we have uh, Pat Avery from uh, GNW. Uh, they build complex uh, uh, microgrids, you know, uh, to support data centers, things like that. And we'll hear his perspective on uh, uh, what it takes to build those types of systems. Um, Robert Lackenmeyer from Shell will tell us about uh, what the oil and gas industry really thinks about the space as a whole and uh, where they see microgrids, energy as a service, and related technologies uh, going. And we have uh, Chris Huster from, um, uh, from uh, Evergreen. Uh, he's actually bringing a, a financing uh, angle to this, essentially um, from the perspective of uh, uh, the uh, Inflation Reduction Act and a lot of the incentives that are actually coming into the space and what it takes to actually connect up everything. So what we're hoping to do is to, with these diverse perspectives from the panel, really zone in on uh, sort of these two themes. Um, so we're going to try to connect up, uh, the, you know, the, just look at the Venn diagram on the left. We have things like facility energy management from an end consumer's perspective, uh, whoever is the energy consumer there. Things like uh, transportation electrification, a huge topic and having a significant impact on this area. And then the concept of services delivery, right? Uh, rather than just delivering electrons at an outlet, what does uh, energy service uh, delivery actually look like? And on the right-hand side, you know, so pictures that uh, I'm sure all of us are familiar with, you know, stuff at the bottom, you know, generation storage uh, loads, uh, some sort of um, a site intelligence to, uh, to bind it together into some sort of a microgrid or um, an energy management system, then the connectivity back up into the cloud to actually get the data that's trapped on these individual locations out from that location and opening it up to a lot of other analytics and other capabilities. And at the very top, you have the services layer, right? Who offers what service and the ecosystem that actually lives at that level. So this kind of sets the stage for this topic of microgrids and energy as a service. And, uh, uh, you know, so that's what uh, we are hoping to get into a lot today. Now, without, uh, you, know, uh, you know, delaying the whole conversation much more, let me uh, have the panelists introduce themselves and give a quick introduction to what they do. And then uh, we'll dive into some uh, Q&A. So, Mike. Thanks, Sunil. So as Sunil mentioned, uh, my name is Mike Bates. I'm the general manager for Intel's Energy Center of Excellence. Uh, we are an overlay to the worldwide sales and marketing organization at Intel. And our primary purpose for living <laughs> is to look for opportunities to apply Intel technology and solve some of the biggest challenges in the energy transition, uh, the transition from what we've all seen and lived with for the last 100 plus years to something I think will be a big part of the future going forward. So looking forward to today's conversation. 
I'm Pat Avery with GNW Electric. I have over 42 years of experience in the industry, starting with a company that used to exist called Westinghouse, through ABB, Cooper Power Systems, a startup out here in Irvine, California called CTC Global in the last 12 and a half years with GNW. My group is responsible for power grid automation. We do everything from the grandparent of automation, which is non-communicating loop scheme, all the way up to turnkey microgrid. And I'm Bob Lockenmeyer, and I'm the uh, microgrid technology lead for the Renewable and Energy Solutions uh, group within Shell. Um, really looking at how uh, microgrids and uh, energy solutions can help Shell really get involved in helping to encourage and manage the energy transition uh, from the typical fossil fuels to renewables. Uh, Chris Eukster, I'm the CEO, co-founder of Evergreen. Um, we work with companies to optimize how the Inflation Reduction Act uh, works. The rules and regs are still to, to come out, but this is a massive amount of capital that is ready to flow into the clean energy transition. Um, and, you know, there's corporate corporate dollars that are, that are uh, going to be a big part of that. So microgrids are really a, an interesting technology for us. Um, my previous role was I was the chief operating officer at CPS Energy, one of the larger uh, muni uh, utilities, and saw a lot of opportunity that we did a deal with Enchanted Rock uh, there to, to to bring resiliency to uh, certain retail customers, a very successful program. And, you know, I think the challenge for me is is how do we take some of that and kind of have it be part of that clean energy transition? How do you get to a, a resilient zero carbon microgrid? And, um, you know, we're trying to do bring that innovation, those dollars uh, as part of our work with our corporates and our project developers. All right. Thank you all for that. Uh Quick round of introductions. Uh, the format that we'll follow is I'm going to ask the panelists uh, a few questions to kind of get them going, and then I'd like to open it up to the audience. Uh, so uh, get ready with your questions. We'll have somebody running some microphones around, and uh, hopefully we'll keep this um, very dynamic and lively here. With that, I think uh, I'll have to start with the easy questions, right? I'll, I'll ask uh, <laughs> my first question goes to Bob. You know, how do you think uh, microgrids will enable uh, energy as a service, or maybe the other way around? So I think, you know, when you really look at the energy challenge, it has to do with being able to really integrate the whole energy system. And today you've got energy supply, you've got energy users, and they really operate under two very different energy models or, or business models. And I think, uh, you know, traditionally these users uh, would need energy and it would get supplied. And there wasn't a whole lot of complexity around that. You would have, uh, uh, you know, expectations around availability of power and the cost of power and, again, the, the energy system as it currently is designed. Uh, was able to deliver on that pretty well. But now, with things like you brought up earlier, the electrification of transportation, uh, the uh, desire to look for decarbonized uh, solutions, uh, the need for higher availability because more and more uh, of our life revolves around real-time data, real-time availability of, of energy, um, that dynamic is completely changing. and the ability of the existing energy infrastructure to really meet those needs on those three key areas uh, is, is, uh, is really deficient. Um, so I think that microgrids allow for the accommodation of some of the key characteristics, such as, again, uh, the balancing of the energy for reliability and resiliency uh, to be able to accommodate for uh, some of those needs from an on-site basis uh, that plays a critical role. I think uh, also being able to manage overall cost as uh, uh, alternative uh, energy resources uh, behind the meter become more cost-effective. Uh, being able to figure out how to 
balance that and allow that to uh, operate within the context of the energy system as it is today, but with these uh, emerging technologies, microgrids play a critical role in that as well. So I think you know the microgrid piece really brings a lot of the benefits of a grid uh, in those areas, but can uh, do that on a localized basis where you can really meet the customer where they are and what their needs are uh, today and emerging. I'll just add to that, uh, Bob. I think on the service side, so you start with microgrids and does it enable service? So I'll start from the service side and go down. I think. A lot of the companies that we talk to that are looking to deploy, especially on-site microgrids, are doing it as a path to net zero or to lower their carbon footprint. And these are mostly companies with a big carbon footprint problem, heavy industry, steel, cement. Uh, these are the same companies that have very little expertise in microgrids or even driving sustainability. So they're not yet ready to buy via CapEx microgrid solutions and run them and operate them themselves to drive themselves to net zero or to green. So instead, what they're looking for are companies to come in with these technologies, deploy them as a service model, and over time, the SLA and those service contracts would get them to net zero. So I think there's as much of a market driver from customers with a really high problem statement, but with lack of capabilities to actually buy it and so they're looking at the service model as a way to move into this space. Yeah, and I, and I want to differentiate a little bit of what you're talking about there. I think there's a finance service model, and I think then there's a service model that where customers are, are you know, investing mm -hmm. in the infrastructure themselves. But I think at the end of the day, what it really comes down to is that the, the complexity of the system that customers are needing to deploy in order to meet their needs around mm -hmm. decarbonization while maintaining cost, mm -hmm. right, and, and a resilient system. Uh, is getting more and more complex. Mm -hmm. And so microgrids definitely has a pathway to help uh, simplify that, you know, in, by allowing service providers to bring mm -hmm. those added values. Great. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think another interesting thing is kind of what is the definition of service or is it value to the customer? And one of the things, again, when I was at, at CPS Energy, you know, if it's a behind the meter uh, uh, microgrid for resiliency, that's not always used but maybe that capacity is also used for the utility to provide peaking capacity for its portfolio or to sell into the wholesale market. So, you know, having kind of multiple value streams off of a microgrid becomes really interesting, and I think it kind of dovetails into that concept of energy as a service. So I'm hearing uh, sort of two dominant themes in the answers here, and one is uh, energy systems are complex. How do you simplify them on behalf of the uh, end customer? Uh, and then the second one, I think to your point, uh, you have multiple values that you can actually capture from these systems, and you have to configure it to make sense for the uh, particular location, particular customer that you're actually serving. Uh, the mechanism to kind of bring it together, microgrids provide a technology or, a, or the ability to deal with complexity while opening up a flexibility on, on other levels. So I think, is that a good way to summarize kind of the, the synergies there? I'd like to go to Pat, because I know, Pat, you're building a fairly complex uh, microgrid uh, at your uh, headquarters building. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, first of all, I want to say the whole market's not going to energy as a service, okay? There's a large portion of the market uh, that will buy CapEx turnkey microgrids that are customized uh, to their need, and their concern really is, you know, how do I maintain it? They don't want to get into the microgrid uh, business. They want to f stay focused on their core business. So a lot of times they just ask, well, Pat, what do you recommend in terms of uh, uh, maintaining the microgrid? And uh, my uh, supply partners uh, do that. So for every component uh, that I have that I'm representing, uh, that partner will come in for instance, if it's energy storage, energy storage provider, in this case it's cell cube, we're, we're using a flow battery, uh, they will do maintenance on the battery for, for the life of the system. So there are a lot of particularly commercial and industrial customers who will go that route, the route that GNW went. 
Any responses to that? Yeah, no, I, I, I agree that, um, you know, a lot of people are going to want to buy their own equipment, their own solutions, their own systems. I think um, the, the only piece I would, uh, uh, you know, comment on is that, you know, you're, you're talking about the suppliers still kind of delivering that ongoing service around O&M and, you know, uh, optimization. And I think one of the interesting pieces is as, as this starts to unfold, and you start with different pieces of equipment that are starting to create different values and some pointed towards the customer, some pointed towards the markets. How do you reconcile the conflicts there? Who, who, who helps the customer know when is the right time to participate in a market versus, you know, deliver, you know, a value on site? And I think those are some of the emerging questions that I think are going to make this space really interesting. Chris, uh uh, you mentioned uh, the IRA and uh, the fact that uh, there's a lot waiting to happen. Right. Uh, can you give us a pr your perspective on uh, how that is likely to happen, what you're doing in that area, and how it ties into this particular problem with, uh, um, you know, scaling microgrids? Yeah, yeah. No, uh, I mean, I, I'm sure, show of hands, who's heard of the Inflation Reduction Act? <laughs> All right. Good, good, good. Uh, you know, it is game-changing legislation. Um, it brings, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars to the clean energy transition. It's going to transform how uh, how projects get financed, and so all of the above. Um, what's What's interesting about it is uh, is transferability. So, the, for the first time, tax credits can be transferred between two parties. In the old days, it was you the way you monetized tax credit, you had to be an equity owner. So you had tax equity folks. You had to be an equity owner in that project to monetize it. It was really controlled by the tax equity world. You know, the top, you know, top 20 largest banks, uh, Wall Street banks kind of owned this space. And now with the transferability of it, any corporate that, again, there's certain qualifications, but you know, a lot of corporates, companies can basically participate in this marketplace. So now you go from a $20 billion tax equity market to hundreds of billions of dollars of tax appetite that companies have and want to you know, flow those dollars into impact investment and, and really kind of be a part of that transition. So we see our platform basically enables buyers and sellers to come together around tax credits. There's a lot of diligence that has to happen. This, you know, you want to get this stuff right because you're filing with the IRS and you could be audited. And so it's important to get to, to make sure that that project is, is, is a, a good project and, and it is following the IRS uh, uh, rules and regulations. So that's what we do. So we work with companies to basically, you know, find projects and uh, stand up projects, um, both on the REC side, renewable energy certificates, as well as the tax credit side. I think microgrids is super interesting. There's a lot of interesting elements of it. It's, it doesn't stand out as a single category within the uh, IRA, at least as, as, as it stands today. But the underlying technologies are, are enabled by the, by the IRA. So whether it's solar or fuel cell or storage or even the controller itself, um, you know, those all have appetite for, that, for, this, uh, for these tax credits. And the dollars are not, uh, the dollars are significant. You're talking about tax credits from 6% of a project all the way to 70% if you qualify for energy community and domestic content and uh, low income uh, adders. So you can get all the way up to 70% for certain types of projects. Um, and so, it, you know, they're meaningful dollars and it can really change the economics of a project from being underwater to being uh, profitable for that that owner or that developer. So we're pretty excited about it and we're seeing a lot of interest in this space. So you, you said something that uh, uh, I thought was very interesting. The fact that a lot of these incentives apply to the uh, component technologies as opposed to a microgrid as a whole. That sort of having to unbundle a microgrid to actually capture the in investment and then somehow putting Humpty Dumpty back together again, right? Yes. <laughs> right. yes. That's what we have to do. Yes. Uh, so actually, I'm going to go to Mike and ask a question uh, uh, directly tied to this. Uh, the complexity of microgrids, uh, the complexity of doing things like, uh, you know, what Chris was just talking about, uh, how do you see the, the digital infrastructure for all of the things that we are talking about coming into play? What has to change to make it easier to connect all the dots and actually uh, get to the value a heck of a lot sooner 
than is currently prevalent. You, 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 it's very difficult to actually do the engineering, the financial analysis, and by the time you get to the get to deciding that a project is actually doable, you know, three years have gone by, right? Mm -hmm. How can a digital framework um, help accelerate this? Or is it possible? Or are we mm -hmm. stuck with this, uh, uh, you know, this uh, friction uh, in the industry? We're definitely not stuck. Um, I think different industries have gone through this digitization at different times and different periods based on different market drivers. This particular in, in, uh, industry, the energy industry, really hasn't been forced through that type of disruption. The model that we see today is basically the model that Thomas Edison developed, however many years ago that was, uh, but it's changing now. And I think the need to digitize the grid uh, and then behind the meter, microgrids is one of the biggest um, I'm not going to call it obstacles, biggest opportunities for us to, to, to see microgrid scale. And part of that is the lack of compute and the lack of compute capabilities at the edge where all this is happening. It's not happening at the coal plant. It's not happening at the utility data center. It's all happening in real time. I mean, I stress that in real, real time, uh, not real time as in you know, a few seconds, I mean, immediate uh, reaction has to happen. So if you're going to extract all the benefits out of a microgrid, including auditing the impacts, but also participating in ancillary services like frequency regulation, for example, requires, I think, an investment in a higher level of compute at the very, very edge of our grid to do things. And it's not just compute to do like AI-enabled control, it also includes low latency comms uh, that don't exist uh, at the edge of the grid either. So I think the push at the utility side is pretty fast paced towards digitalization. Again, you got to unbundle a lot of things that have been built. Um, I've been inside several substations and I've seen how they've been built over time. It's almost like an onion, you know, it's like point solution over point solution over point solution that creates something called SCADA. Uh, and what we're going to see in the future is r literally going to look like a data center sitting inside a substation. And I got some pictures to show you from utilities that have gone through this with Intel. You have a, I don't know, 60 feet of electrical mechanical equipment replaced with six feet, two server racks, where all the workloads are consolidated onto one compute platform. And now on that compute platform, you're not able to push AI, AI that can do things like real-time load balancing. It can automate services in the way based on customers' preferences. That digitalization doesn't exist today in the electric grid. And I think it's the market's driving it that way, and I think technology is also enabling it to happen. Any responses from anyone else? It's a long time in coming, for I sure. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, then I go to ask this. Uh, if you define what we're doing the way in which all of you are defining the various perspectives that are coming in, what exactly is a microgrid? I don't know, Bob. What is a microgrid? Yeah. I thought you were the expert. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You're the panelist. <laughs> I get to grill you. Okay. Um, well, again, you know, I, I go back to, uh, you know, what is it that we've always expected from the grid? You know, and a microgrid is a microcosm of it. And so, you know, the grid, we expect to get, you know, cost-effective power that is highly reliable. And um, in the past, we didn't worry about decarbonization, but we are today. And so, you know, a microgrid, I think, is meant to uh, ultimately be able to uh, meet a customer where they're at and meet their needs around those three highest level of uh, priority, I think. You know, uh, available power, resilient, reliable, uh, cost effective, and decarbonized. And I think the role of the microgrid is to uh, be able to give a customer choices on how to do that and how to deliver that based on their specific operations. I like that. I think a question for me on micro is is a microgrid a representation of the grid of the past or the grid of the future? Yeah. And you know, and especially with th important th things like resiliency, like solar and storage are just not there yet on you know multi-day, you know, long duration, uh, re you know, re storage and, and resiliency. So, does that automatically put us here or here? And so I, I think there's there's an interesting kind of 
point of view on, on where do microgrids go? Well, I, I think, you know, I, I'll just comment on that if I can. I think traditionally we think about microgrids, we think about solar, we think about battery energy storage, right? Um, but, you know, they can include a lot of other things, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, uh, things like hydrogen, fuel cells, um, you know, um, renewable natural gas. I mean, you know, whatever, you know, we want to look at and, and be able to characterize as renewable, you know, it's really uh, energy efficiency, right? Mm -hmm. All of that actually is some, uh, components of a microgrid. Um, you know, things like flywheels too, right? I mean, you know, so really what we need to think about is not as microgrids as, you know, something that can enable se uh, solar and storage, but again, something that can able, enable all of the technologies that allow us to, again, gain those three uh, values. Just going to add one more thing to that. I think the electric grid and the microgrid are going through a similar transition where today I would call them hardware defined to something in the future is going to be software defined. Mm -hmm. So you create a, a grid around the data collected from whatever devices that you're trying to manage. Uh, today it could be you could just connect an HVAC with an um, EV charger, and that's a microgrid. But the software, this, the, the hardware that collects the data from the EV charger can also collect other data, and it can be an energy management. So I think the commonality in this transition is we're, all, we're moving towards software-defined infrastructure and away from proprietary hardware-defined uh, solutions. That's very interesting because uh, um, you are uh, sort of providing a definition for a microgrid as a as an abstraction capability, right? It's really not about the widgets or the equipment, but you have an abstraction over a basket of things that you can mix and match. Mm -hmm. And if you can actually deliver the results that the customer is looking for with some flexibility, mm -hmm. then you have the right, uh, I guess, nodal capabilities to actually build out, you know, one or a, or a million microgrids. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. yep. well, that's, that's fantastic. Well, but with that, let me uh, actually open up uh, to the audience. Uh, I'm sure all of you have been, uh, you know, uh, working on your uh, uh, questions there for the panel. Um, That's right. Hi there, Gus Montano from Macquarie. Um, I just have a question about the IRA and how that would possibly cover, let's say, microgrids that are just purely sourced by natural gas gensets. And I asked that because I was reading an article um, and it was talking about all these microgrids in Ohio or some state um, that are purely fueled by gensets, and it's actually increased the state's carbon footprint. Would the IRA cover that? What concessions need to be made? I know the EPA have come out with some standards talking about fossil fuels. So just trying to understand that whole idea of microgrids that are, sure, resilient, but just fueled by carbon-emitting natural gas. Yeah, I think that's a great question. That was kind of what I was trying to tease out, like, is the microgrid a, a sort of a, a representation of our past grid, or is it the future grid? And you know, for resiliency purposes, if you want to have power for th days, you know, uh, you may need a, a natural gas type solution. Obviously, you got renewable natural gas. So, you know, what is the definition of from a customer perspective for for that for that microgrid? From an IRA standpoint, you can only get the tax credits for the clean fuels associated with that microgrid. So, if it has a you know, a, a fossil footprint, you cannot get credit for that piece of it. So that's, you know, that may, that may kind of tilt the economics towards, you know, cleaner microgrids. Uh, but the bottom line is if you can't deliver on the resiliency for multiple days, you know, you get the, the, the project economics may look great for six hours or eight hours, whenever the battery can perform, but you can't serve that customer's needs. So I think it's an interesting, uh, question, but to answer directly, the IRA don't, does not cover the, the fossil component of that. So you mentioned that uh, like the IRA definitely is a tailwind be behind the bytes and the atoms problem, but we still have the basically red tape problem of interconnecting. And as the last panel in the main ballroom pointed out, the financing is a hurdle because of that. So like, how do we get past that? Because you can't get to the EAS stage until you can get past those big ticket items. So what, what can you not do today? I mean, what, what do you believe? So I, I agree there is, um, 
challenge to interconnect to the grid. There's a delay, and in, in some cases, I work with one utility, there's a three-year backlog to interconnect an on-site renewable generation customer because the grid is not ready to integrate that customer. But that customer is still reaping the benefits and selling into the market. They're just not doing it directly interconnected to the grid. So my question to you is, what do you, what do you believe is not, um, what are we not able to do today because we're not able to do the interconnection? So if, I mean, if you want, so like we tried to deploy in a pilot, right, with a low medium income neighborhood in where, I, where we work, right? And so, uh, and I won't name the utility, but one of the biggest in the country, right, uh, used it as a poster child. Mm -hmm. But then every, every other week when I talked to them, it was like, oh, you have to pay for an interconnection study. Mm -hmm. You have to do an assessment. Um, you have to do, be part of the IRP, mm -hmm. right? and you have to pay for it. Mm -hmm. And then we still own the asset. And mm -hmm. I'm like, this is an LMI community. How are they supposed to fund this? And we're adding a value to the grid. Right. We can show you that. Yeah, so, so real quick, it's not a technology problem uh, that you're talking about. It's, um, in my opinion, it's a policy and regulation. Correct. Um, I wish Intel or the, anybody on this panel could step in and be a catalyst to change, but that, industry has served in a natural monopoly for, 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 for hundreds of years or hundred years or plus. And to, to move us, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show my age. So I'm old enough to remember the telecommunications deregulation that happened 30 something years ago or however long it was. The companies that build all that infrastructure were not the companies that made the money once it became deregulated. Southwestern Bell, for example. It was Facebook, Google, Microsoft. They're the ones that made the money off of all that infrastructure that they built. The same thing is happening right now today, mm -hmm. the inflection point with the utility industry and microgrids. There's a lot of services, there's a lot of revenue to be generated by serving microgrids to customers. The utilities, this is my own opinion, are using the current structure to buy enough time to figure out how to get into this market. While that they're doing that, there's a lot of providers coming in to provide the service. So I think it's not an interconnection issue. I think it's giving utilities the ability to participate in this new market, taking the gloves off from a regulatory and policy perspective. And it's, again, I don't think it's a technology. Question. Although I, I would say that there are technological solutions yes. to mm -hmm. be able to uh, avoid an interconnection agreement. Yes, but you would also need to oversize your DERs. What's that? You, I think you would need to oversize your DERs to do that. Well, it depends. Mm -hmm. I, it, I, and I'm, I don't want to, it depends on your situation okay. and what you're trying to solve for. Um, but I think there are potentially some pathways where you can, you know, avoid the interconnection agreement. But, you know, not every project would allow for that, but there are some ways of designing the systems that would allow you to avoid that. Yeah, and I've, I've sat on both sides of that. I was with the utility for many years, and I've now I'm kind of in the developer world. And I, I really, I do very much see your point, and I, I don't know if utilities really realize the level of complexity that they put on um, on onto developers and projects. They're trying to set a standard, trying to make it fair for everyone, but I think there's so much more that they could do to, to be more sort of customer developer friendly in terms of enabling anyone to kind of connect up. I think that's just going to take time. I mean, it's going to be at the policy level, it's at the PUC. But, but quite frankly, if they don't figure that out, you know, ultimately they could get disintermediated because at some point there will be some technology that you can put behind the meter and it serves your load forever and ever. And like, it's the utility does not want to be in that space where they lose their customer. Um, and so, I, I, I'm saying I, I, yes. I hear you, and I, I do think it's an issue. And utilities. I think our, to Mike's point and Bob's point are slow to move. Um, so you gotta you know, figure out technology workarounds and other ways of doing it. But I think keeping your voice active uh, there, whether it's at, at the commission level or, 
or even at the low at, with your utility team and just escalate issues like you, things when things escalate a utility they become a little bit more sort of noticeable so just do what whatever you, you can to make sure that people hear your story yeah and, and, and be able to look at the flip side of it in a lot of ways that resistance is a self-fulfilling prophecy mm -hmm. because it is what is helping to drive and push the innovation <laughs> that is looking yeah. for alternative solutions in a very cost-effective way to completely avoid that problem. Yep, that's a good point. Yeah, I, I mean, I just don't want to realize a grid that is EAS, but grid defection, right? Like we want to, the whole point of renewables is you can trade across wherever it's generated to where it's needed. Mm -hmm. So There's I think a lot of other barriers to that, too. <laughs> I was going to say, if they can start to get energy traded like they're doing with ITC, right. we'll be in great we'll shape. <laughs> So, uh, related to that, and I think the point that uh, Mike was uh, making that uh, in transformations uh, uh, in, the, in the telecom sector, you know, the incumbents, the innovators, the winners at the end of the day are all somewhat non-intuitive, right? Uh, you can talk about it after the fact, but, uh, you know, how, how, how do you predict uh, how to position yourself? Um, I want to throw this question out there and say, who do you think will ultimately crack the nut in this energy transformation space and, uh, you know, really make a difference. Which stakeholder that we today know of or don't know of, you know, feel free to speculate. Um, so, uh, interested in your take on that. I'm going to go back on my word. I mean, I, I think the utilities own the platform for the delivery of the service that we're talking about uh, and the services that we're not talking about, we don't even know about yet. They own the data from the meters, they understand load profiles, they understand how to use that platform to do load balancing. So they have all the components. They are restricted in some ways in what they can and can't do, but I believe that we're gonna figure it out. And then the utilities, also they have the billing relationship with the customer as well. Um, I think the utilities will ultimately be the provider. And it may not be what you see when you pay, write your check, it may be a third party, but I still think the utilities are going to be in the game. So, you, so you're actually saying that uh, utilities might reinvent themselves as the uh, uh, the delivery platform for energy as a service, while other providers may be the parties offering up the service. Yeah, I think there's there's a handful of utilities that are already going down this path. They're the pioneering utilities. A couple of them are out here in California. Um, and everyone knows if what happens out here, the rest of the U.S. <laughs> adopts it, right? Um, so I think there's enough utilities that are taking the, the challenge. They're, they're probably out in front, and they're taking the hits from legislators and policymakers, but I, I think they're going to figure their way in. And anyone else? I'm not so confident of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think we should let uh, Bob elaborate a little. Yeah, go, go ahead, Bob. <laughs> you know, I, I, think, I think part of the challenge is it's not just the utilities. I think it's the business model that they have to work with. Mm -hmm. you, have, you have to not only get the utilities to want to, you know, change their own model and be able to really provide the services that customers want, which, by the way, Today, we're just scratching the surface on, on you know, what that's going to mean, right? Uh, because we haven't even really fully conceptualized what does uh, a fully decarbonized system scope one through three really mean? What does that really look like? What's that really going to take, right? Same thing with, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, being able to maintain a cost-effective system, resilient system. And so much of that actually happens at a customer site that, you know, you've got to convince the regulators that utilities can get involved with, right? Mm -hmm. So I think you have the utilities and and a lot of their, uh, uh, you know, history and their risk aversion and a lot of the things that uh, are embedded in that, that uh, industry, but you also have the whole regulated environment. And I just think when you combine all of that, um, that's going to be extremely hard for the utilities to really lead uh, where things need to go. And I think ultimately energy service providers are likely to be the, uh, the leaders. I think utilities will need to come along. I mean, the longer they fight this battle of uh, 
not allowing in, interconnect on a system that many times is, is already constrained anyway, <laughs> the more that it just is going to exacerbate their problem and their issues. So I, I just I think they're going to play an important role. Mm. I just don't know that they'll be the leader. Chris or Pat? Yeah, I, I think it's the consumer that is the primary driver of it. If you look at history, the reason why generation got deregulated came from consumers. Mm -hmm. right. And now we're on the T&D side and consumers are saying, I want 24 seven power and you're not giving it to me. That's the reason why we, we designed and, and built and installed our microgrid. You know, we're an essential company as it relates to uh, COVID customers our, our customers being utilities, they need our, our equipment and want our equipment. Uh, we had a storm that took us out for six hours. We had to send everybody home. My boss, John Mueller, the owner, he lost millions of dollars. The next day he goes, Pat, build me a microgrid. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's consumer driven. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I agree with everyone, everything everyone said on the panel here. I, I think it, it's kind of hard to tell. I think if, if, if the path on the energy transition from a technology standpoint is evolutionary and it gives the utilities time to figure the stuff like this stuff out, I think they're going to be a big part of it because, like Mike said, they've got a huge platform. But if technology happens faster and they don't get on board or they're slow to act, I think they lose. So I think it, there's a lot of factors out there that, um, that could play either way. So the potential is uh, there. It uh, remains to be seen. Mm -hmm. All right. If you take it one step further, so can the consumers that Pat's talking about, and these some of them are really large consumers that can't stand not having power, they keep building microgrids, they keep pu putting more energy. Mm -hmm. These are also customers of the utility. Mm -hmm. So would that customer demand drive the regulators to allow the utilities to serve their customers more. I don't know, it's a, it's a theoretical question, but feels like, again, I'm not giving up on the utilities. I, I think they gotta play, uh, and I think maybe your Pat's right, that the consumers drive the regulators to make changes. I, I think at the end of the day, everybody has a role. Yeah. 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 I don't think anybody's going away, yeah. right? So I think it's a matter of, you know, what, what is that role ultimately, mm -hmm. that is the question mark. Do we have another up? Oh, there's a question back there. Just a comment. Uh, think about 50, 80, maybe 100 years from now, when technology made it uh, where you can actually generate uh, energy uh, quite cost effectively. Do you still think uh, utilities are needed? In my, in my, in my sense, the, the, the time is take it to the lowest level. What's the tiniest microgrid system that you can have is, is our home. We can have different different uh, type of sources for our home. You basically don't need, if you have the controller, you basically don't need the utility. So let me, let me push back a little bit. So I, I live in Austin, Texas, and I live through, I forgot what the name of the storm. Hurry. Yeah, her, yeah, it's not a hurricane, sorry. Uh, Winter Storm, Winter Storm Fury. Fury. Yeah. Um, and everyone saw the pictures of downtown Austin, downtown Houston, where every skyscraper was totally lit up and the residential areas where people literally were dying was dark. Uh, no one could get to those buildings. The energy was running, but you couldn't even get there because the roads were. If the utility deployed the technology we're talking about today, you could easily take the, tech, take the power off of the downtown buildings and push it down to the residential buildings. They're, the reason they say they couldn't is because critical facilities run the same feeder. But that's, to be honest, is bullshit. I mean, technology does exist to be able to do that level. So even in that scenario, I think the utility is still going to be needed to be able to navigate us through system-wide um, emergencies like that one. So I, I don't, again, I, I sound like a poster child for the utilities, but I, I still feel like they're going to be needed, even in that scenario you just described. Again, I don't, I don't think it's about them disappearing. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I think even 100 years from now, 
you know, there's going to be a need to interconnect uh, customers. I, I do think that instead of a radial system, maybe we're going to look at more of a mesh system, mm -hmm. which, you know, at that point, perhaps we can count on our neighbors, right, rather than necessarily utility, but getting energy from point A to point B, that's still a third party, right? Yep. So. All right, that was fun. Let's switch to something a little simpler. How about a Slido question? You have one, Kimberly? Um, while she does that, uh, I'll tee up my next question. Um, we, we already touched on uh, you know, uh, uh, EVs and transportation electrification quite a bit. Um, what are your thoughts about uh, what will happen to microgrids, energy as a service, electric utilities, as that intersection uh, you know, really continues to get larger and larger? Uh, just, uh, you know, when was it over the weekend, uh, I got a rental car, which was an EV, and uh, had to plug it in somewhere. Um, most of the cables here at the EV thing in this hotel were broken, right? So they wouldn't, they wouldn't work. Uh, so drove around looking for one, asked where, where's the closest EV uh, charging station, and they took me close to uh, the, uh, you know, the um, uh, uh, Disneyland thing just across the road from there. Driving there, there were about 50 chargers in a row. Every single one was plugged in. I couldn't plug it in because every single one was taken, and I hadn't seen that many in a row you know, anywhere else. And I was th I'm thinking, you know, the car is fantastic to drive. You know, anybody that drives that will want something like that, right? And uh, now when you look at this intersection saying, I have facility energy management, I need to power my lights over here, everything that we're actually using, and now you have, uh, you know, hundreds of uh, vehicles in this garage right there. If you, if you electrify, if everybody's going electric and it's all there, what happens? Can the grid step up to the plate and get it done to actually power it? Or are we going to say, sorry, uh, we will only have, uh, uh, you know, two electric vehicles worse per city block? What are we going to do? Yeah, even worse when you start getting into DC fast charging, maybe 10 to 15 minute charges at retail. Um, and I, I'm going to make a couple of comments. But one, I, th I think even the EV auto manufacturers aren't even a, quite aware of the challenge that they have themselves. So we work with one um, EV manufacturing company that makes a very popular electric vehicle truck, and it has a very high power uh, draw and also has a lot of storage capability. Um, they're just now getting their hands around the fact that they can only sell so many per feeder. And now it's, they've got their attention. Like, wait a second, I, no one's ever told me I can't sell a vehicle. If you're telling me there's certain places where I can sell them and certain places I can't, then it's a problem that they need to solve. Um, and I, whether it's a chicken in there, whether it's gonna slow EVs Adoption, I don't know, I can't say for sure. But if we go back to the utility question, utilities are standing in the way in, a, in some regards on the full electrification of transportation. Uh, and then when you want to move out of the garage for charging, which is mostly where it happens today, and there's no sense of urgency, plug in, when you get home from work, you unplug it and you go to work the next day, no big deal. But if you're expecting a 10 minute charge, um, where are you gonna go get that? Is it going to be at the fueling station where you normally go today, right next to the gas? I don't think so. But I think it's, a, it's an unopened question today. Where, once it starts moving into fast charging, where, where is it going to go? And it's not in your home because you don't have a level three fast charger in your home. I think the other thing that is interesting about this problem is, is it's a last, like the transformer that's sitting at your house is you know, feeding two homes. And putting two EVs in each of those homes is like putting a couple air conditioner units in those houses. Like those transformers are not set up to serve that, you know, to serve mass deployment of, of retail EVs out there. You can do point to point, you know, fast charging stations. You know, those are projects, but like the utility has a major, major challenge at that kind of last mile, and it'll be interesting to see how they play that out. So just building on that, um, if that's the case, and you don't have enough built up capacity today. Uh, that's almost the definition for where, uh, for a case example for microgrids, right? So what can I do behind that choke point 
to uh, require more, I, I can have more power on that side, maybe not continuously, but I have, I have availability there. What needs to change to actually do that? So today, if I uh, put up a load on this side of the, on the, on the customer side of the meter, uh, which is above the rated capacity of my interconnect, you know, you're not going to be allowed to do that. Uh, back to your point about software defined or with the intelligent controls, I can actually manage that so that I can keep that demand below some level. Will that type of solution uh, uh, you know, uh, happen with microgrids? What's keeping us from doing that? I mean, I think it gets back to both a technology and a policy question. Like if you wanted to set up a microgrid across several businesses or two homes, like it gets back to that, you know, the utility has the regulatory oversight to make that happen or allow that to happen. And so you've got to work with them from a policy perspective, but maybe there's some work around the technology side if there's ways of kind of, you know, optimizing that or, you know, so I, to me it gets down to, it, can technology outpace uh, the regulatory aspects or the regulatory aspects with a huge platform that the utilities have, you know, if, if we could figure out the interconnection issues and the grid issues from a policy standpoint, the utilities have a platform to do this, like, overnight. Mm -hmm. but. Obviously, that's not going to happen. So now the question is, is how does technology kind of figure this out? Because technology can happen overnight. If you leave it to technology, it will kind of look like a Uber and the New York yeah, City medallion right. fight. Right. That's exactly what will happen. Right. <laughs> so, any other points, Bob? No, I, I, I have a related example. I have a uh, potential customer who bought uh, five Tesla semis and is building a greenfield site uh, in, in Illinois. And we designed the microgrid to allow the potential customer to charge those semis at night and do all of their routes uh, during the day. What, what was the interconnection for that like? Did the, well, did the facility, uh, that location well, have the capacity? I'm, I'm glad you brought up the, the interconnection because uh, that, that was an issue uh, for us, but because it probably helped us being a, a big customer as well as a supplier to ComEd, we basically just went in there and sat down with the executives and explained to them why we were doing what we were doing. And in the end, we are now the only DERMS pilot for, for ComEd, and they're allowing us to put our inverters on grid forming and grid following. So, I mean, they stepped up to the plate and said, yeah, we see some value in this, and, and the value they're going to get is they'll have access to our microgrid. They'll see exactly how it runs, how well or not it, it does. <laughs> so it's possible, but you need to know how to talk to utility. Exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we have some, an answer here on Slido for, uh, are you currently developing or delivering energy as a service solutions? Uh, it says uh, no, 63%, and yes, 38%. So one third of uh, you are, or whoever responded are actually uh, you know, delivering energy as a service solutions. That's interesting, so hopefully we'll see that uh, uh, trend uh, continue to build up. So we are almost out of time, so we just have uh, yeah, a few minutes left. So um, let me actually um, turn back to our panel and uh, ask them for some uh, closing thoughts You know, after this uh, uh, interesting session. I hope all of you found it to be useful and thought-provoking. Um, you know, I'll start at this end. Chris, you want to? Uh, no, I, I, again, I think great session. Thank you for organizing us and and leading us here. Um, look, I, I think the the clean energy transition is is sort of a once in a generation opportunity here for all of us. Whether you know we are consumers, whether we're business owners, developers, project you know uh, projects or utilities. So, I think. Um, you know, this is as big as a telecom revolu you know, ev you know, revolution that happened. Uh, smartphone, like this is huge. And this is a trillion dollar industry kind of undergoing massive change. And there's gonna be opportunities, there's gonna be winners and losers. Um, but in my view, the, the, the future is bright for all of us. You know, one of the things that uh, we really didn't touch on that I think actually makes interesting this interconnection discussion is looking at how digi digitization uh, allows us to uh, the, have these behind the meter microgrids and assets participate in energy markets. And you know, I think as utilities start to realize, especially with the electrification and transportation, 
the immense impacts that are going to be that are going to happen and the constraints that they're going to have to uh, start facing if we can look at how uh, the uh, digitization of energy allows for those assets to help solve some of these problems for the utility perhaps we can create a win-win discussion around uh, you know simplifying things yeah, for for me I uh I say everybody plays a role in this thing, and, and one of the biggest drivers, whether you believe in global warming or not, is sustainability. It's the ticket to the dance now for, for our industry. We can't supply equipment to many uh, customers unless we show them our sustainability plan. Now we have a whole department <laughs> that just, you know, does that. Uh, and we all benefit from that, and microgrids play a, a primary role in helping to deliver sustainability solutions. So I'm, I'm really encouraged by the future because of that. Yeah, I th I'm just playing off what Pat just said. I think that creates a sense of urgency uh, at the sea level to drive sustainability. But I think what we're going to talk more and more about is the resiliency side. I think microgrids and resiliency to the impacts of climate change are going to go hand to hand. So not only is this a carbon mitigating solution, microgrids, it also allows you to keep the lights on, allows yeah. you to keep your family safe and happy. And I think that's really, that's, that's a very emotional connection. And we're going to, it's not like the climate impacts are going to go away. They're just going to keep getting worse and worse. So I think a lot of what's going to drive all of this is going to be some of those impacts. Well, thank you, panelists, and please join me in giving them a big round of applause here.